Today, I have a first time guest and we're going to discuss a topic we have never discussed before here on Debt Free in 30, and that's inflation and deflation. Why? Well, my guest thinks that our entire economic system is built around inflation, but we need to prepare for deflation. And that will have a profound impact on the debt we carry. And we're going to discuss it starting right now. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. My guest today has started many companies. He's an advisor and director to many more, and he wrote a book that we're going to be discussing today. Jeff Booth, welcome to Debt Free and 30. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me, Doug. Thank you very much. So the book you wrote, and I'll put links to this in the show notes, is called The Price of Tomorrow, Why Deflation is the Key to an Abundant Future. And I want to spend most of the show talking about the implications of that, but To start off, I would like to give you my definition of inflation, and then you can tell me where I'm completely wrong in this this definition. (laughs) So so here's, I I think the average person goes, oh, I know what inflation is, that's prices going up. Now, I disagree with that. You know, just because prices go up doesn't mean we we have inflation. Um, I mean, I noticed behind you there, you've got a guitar. So let's assume that you and I start a rock group. And we're not very good at the start. We can only charge $2 for a ticket to our shows. And then gradually we get better and our tickets become more and more valuable. And finally, we're selling out stadiums and people are paying a thousand bucks. Well, the price of our tickets have gone up. That's not inflation. That's just the price of something went up. Inflation to me is like blowing up a balloon. Okay. You've got a balloon, you put more air into it it gets bigger. Now, of course, we're not talking about air, we're talking about money, you put more money into a system, and it it gets bigger. So the way I conceptualize this in my head, you and I are playing a game of Monopoly, the game starts out with the banker each giving us $1,000. And you and I being the crazy guys that we are, we decide, you know what, we're going to start off with an auction because we both want park place. So the most you can bid or the most I can bid is a thousand bucks because that's all we got. But then the banker says, oh, you know what? I'm going to give you each an extra thousand dollars. I'm going to increase the money supply. Well, now you and I can both bid two thousand dollars on that property we want. So that to me is inflation. There's more money. And as a result, prices are able to go up. Now, how did I do? Am I even close in that conception of inflation. Yeah, I, I think so. I think I think it's a it's a it's a difficult topic because people are, essentially don't measure the system they live in. And so when when governments are cr- ensuring that prices go up by printing money or lowering interest rates to tr- create debt or, and then can't pay the debt and then print money, they force prices up. So this a, a more simple uh, t- definition though is when kind of the all uh, goods and services go up in price um, it, because, because it captures the other thing, uh, the, 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 uh, the money printing um, as, as, a, as a byproduct. Deflation is the opposite. Price, uh, prices in real terms go down um, and your money is worth more. One, one interesting byproduct of this, if you, if you, and maybe for many on your show, um, if you think about uh, or the listen to your, your show, if you think about how inflation is a hidden tax on society's most vulnerable, um, when you manipulate money and you make prices go up, what happens is if let's imagine you had um, five houses and the prices of those five houses would go up a lot more than somebody. And if somebody didn't have uh, houses and they were renting, their rent would go up. So inflation, when you're printing money, like what's happening today, is actually wage deflation. And, and uh, so it's the same thing. It's just the opposite side of the coin. You're actually reducing wages in real terms, and you're making it more expensive for people to live. So that, that is, as a consequence, those with assets um, benefit, and those without assets uh, are, are crushed. And what, you, what ends up happening as a result of manipulating money is you have a whole bunch of people wanting to try to play the game that try to leverage up to try to play the game and get hurt. Um, And so essentially you don't have, you don't have a sound economic model. It's all, it's all designed around, around manipulation. Yeah. And you hit on two key issues, jobs and um, assets. So I want to, I want to definitely get to both of those things. This let's stay with the big picture for a minute, then, because 
before the show, I actually did some show prep. First time ever. I went to the Statistics Canada website and I downloaded onto a spreadsheet the inflation rate in Canada for the last 60 years, like since 1960 or whatever. And I can see that, uh, you know, in 1975, 1976, it was over 12%, 81, 82. We had a bit of a spike as well. Um, it's been positive every year since before I was born. So why are we having a discussion about deflation when we've always had inflation? Deflation has never been a thing. Okay, so this is really, in, in, in writing my book, I had to come to terms with some of the same things that you're uh, talking about now. But let's, let's first examine inflation. So inflation is effectively what I said is a hidden tax that takes money from somebody in a hidden form and gives it to somebody else. So if you have assets or stocks or anything else, you're a winner. And if you have more houses and more real estate or more stocks, you're a bigger winner. And if you don't, you're a bigger loser. So, so if you, if you just said, if you just examined that statement, if somebody takes something from you without your knowledge to give to somebody else, is that a theft? Sounds like it. Sounds like it. Right. And, and I know these are harsh words, but it sounds like a theft. Um, and so what if, what if that theft is only done at 2%? Is it not a theft anymore? What is, if it's done at 5%? What if it's done at 20%? Does the rate of stealing change the theft? Yeah, so is petty crime any different than big crime? Yeah, but if, now if you're now talking these large numbers and if you're wealthy and you have tons of money and tons of assets and you're poor and you don't, that rate of theft may, matters a lot. And so it, it compounds over time. And so when you see the division of society, what you're seeing is a division of society as a result of this. Now, that's on one side. That's on the inflationary side. But people, people have been conditioned to believe we must, an economy must have inflation to thrive. And, and that's what I, what I realized. When, and, and what, so I'm a technology entrepreneur and everything I do is in technology and I've built a lot of successful companies. What I realized is, Technology is moving into every industry at blinding speed and technology reduces prices. In fact, every CEO puts technology in the company to give more for less. And so I could not figure out why prices weren't coming down everywhere. And so, so if technology is moving into, uh, in, into every industry and it's, and, it's, and it's exponentially moving, you'd think that, that, that something must be blocking that essentially abundance for society. What, what, what effectively you use technology to re, to save your time so does a ceo to give more for less and so if something's blocking that from reaching society that seems like a, even a bigger crime so so i wanted to investigate what's what's holding that up why aren't prices coming down and 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 what i realized what what i saw is there's over 250 trillion dollars of debt for an 80 trillion dollar global economy and you could question, okay, can that debt be repaid? If could the economy somehow grow faster than that debt, faster than the interest payments on that debt, and maybe one day repay it? But 250 trillion is a lot of money. When you think about a trillion, if you paid back a dollar a second, it is 32,700 years. Um, so, uh, so it's a lot, a lot of money. But on further examination, 185 trillion dollars of that debt came within the last 20 years, as you would predict it to if technology was moving faster the other way. So technology is trying to reduce prices and give us more for less. And you have central bank policy around the world, not just in Canada, but around the world, trying to stop that from happening. Because if deflation happens, then the debt can't be repaid. And so the debt gets more expensive in real terms. And just like some of your clients, when they hit a, hit a threshold that they can't pay anymore, there's no way to charge, you default. But if the government defaults and you allow deflation, then the entire thing unwinds, everything, central bank, the, the, the banking sector, all the government institutions, everything unwinds. So what they're trying to do by manipulating money is stop that unwind. But they're creating more and more moral hazard by doing so because they're, it's theft. Yeah, we're kicking the can down the road. So uh, as I hear you describe it, 
what I see is a fight between two competing forces here. And so I'm going to get you to elaborate a bit more on the technology end of things, because I think that's kind of the whole key to this. Um, well, I, uh, I'm pretty sure it is, but you can, you can correct me. But so we've got inflation and deflation fighting it out. So in my head, I'm going, okay, I understand this technology thing. I'm going to get you explained a bit more about that. But on the inflationary side, so you've heard of this coronavirus thing, probably COVID. If you're, you're, no, no, no. You haven't. It's this, there's this virus going around right now. It's a big thing. It's in all the news. I believe that that will be inflationary because in Canada, where you and I are, you're in BC, I'm in Ontario, um, we have not done a great job of making stuff here. I mean, I had Jeff Rubin on the podcast, episode 317, and he was he was talking about that. At the start of the pandemic, we didn't have any N95 masks because we don't make them in Canada. We still were recording this in April 2021. We still can't make vaccines here or anything because we decided what's better is cheap. So let's buy it uh, offshore. And so everything we buy comes from the US or China or whatever. Well, I suspect that what will happen as a result of this is we'll start moving stuff locally. And as a result, we'll start making stuff here. And that's good because, you know, better for national security, better for climate change, because we're not using so much gas and all the rest of it. But that will also mean prices, I guess, will go up because if we were buying something cheaper over there and we're starting to make it here, that's inflationary. And of course, you already talked about all the, the government money printing. That's pretty clearly inflationary as well. So how is it with all these inflationary um you know, all this inflation happening that you think there is, we, we need to have a discussion about deflation. Isn't inflation going to always win this, this battle? So, so ask yourself a simple question, because again, even some of the conversations that you're having right now, your, your thought process is because you're stuck in a system that is getting massive injections of liquidity. So just simply ask this, would houses have gone up? in the last 20 years, if there wasn't $185 trillion of stimulus worldwide, it's pretty obvious it would, they wouldn't. So and that stimulus, so if you print money or you create more and more, you pull forward demand, just like if, if one of your clients spends a million dollars tomorrow, they'll feel like they're rich, but they have to pay back that at some point. So if you actually keep on stimulating forever, you can drive inflation if you do not if, if you essentially stamp a dollar and say now it's $2. All prices will go up in relation to the, 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 the monetary unit. And that's what's happening. And, and, you're, and, and what you're now confusing is, okay, now we're going to stop free trade and we're going to close our borders and everything is going to be made here. Even if you could do that. So now you're going to say, I'm going to bring everything here and create, yes, short term, it might create some inflationary forces, but it would actually make you less competitive globally. So it's likely not to ha not to happen, and you, we've seen history examples of what happens when people close their borders. More more importantly, is this technology is information, and information is free. Um, it, how much do you pay for the calculator on the on your phone, or my guitar tuner, or my uh, or my flashlight on my phone, or my phone? What what we, what we've do done is we're digitizing things, and those things become free, like the air you breathe. And, 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 and by the way, it's, it's just starting most of the, most of it that is in, in front of us. So I'll wait and you can ask a question, but I, there's a bunch more on this topic. Well, and that's, I, that's what I want to talk about. Cause the very first line in your book, you know, the price of tomorrow available now is <laughs> the, uh, Hey, I wrote a book. You got to plug it every time you get right. Um, technology, but, but, but just, I didn't write the book to try to make money from the book. I could care less. I, I have a lot, enough money. Um, I don't, I didn't write a book for fame or for it. I wrote the book for my kids because we're going to, because most people can't see we're entering in a system change and that new system looks entirely different than the system we've lived in. Yeah. And, you can't, you can't see a bubble when you're in it. Right. And, right. and we, we are in it. So the, the first line of the book is technology is deflationary. So I would like you to expand on that. And you can't see it, but uh, my viewers on YouTube can see that I have an old fashioned uh, adding machine here, which I think weighs 50 pounds. It's got the crank and everything else. Probably cost a significant amount of money uh, when, when it was first purchased. I got an old fashioned microphone here too. And you're right. All of those things are now on my phone and they cost zero. I can, 
we could be doing this Zoom call on my phone. Zoom itself doesn't cost anything for a lot of subscriptions. So everything ultimately becomes essentially free. Is that, am I over exaggerating? You're not over exaggerating in the long term if you allow the, the technology forces to be able to, uh, so, uh, to, to reach society. Now, something stopping that, and this all this debt buildup is stopping that, and you were going to have to go through a reset of that, a debt deflation at some point to be able to uh, to 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 realize that this system is different than the system we live we lived in. But but it, that that general trend, and here's a, here's an easy way to, to for people to to get this because it's a comp, it, it's not complicated. Actually, we read the book and everything else. I tried to simplify this, but it's it, it's we don't think that way. The oxygen you breathe is free. Why is it free? Because there's lots of it. Because it's abundant. And and now now take that exact thought pattern to something that and be, economics is built around scarcity, not value. So if if oxygen is the most valuable in your life, you'd think that you should pay the most for it. But it's abundant, so it creates free. You can't charge for it unless you're underwater or in a fire, or in a hospital with COVID, right? <laughs> the, the, um, you can only charge for it if it's scarce. And, and technology creates that everywhere. So let's examine a couple of other, other examples that have already happened, and then we'll look at some that are, ha- are going to happen in the future. So let's, uh, let's look at Blockbuster. We used to go drive to a store, they had 9,000 stores to rent a movie, to be able to to be able to bring that back, to be able to drive back and pay late fees on, on the movie, and they had a huge cost structure around uh, around that um, to, to be able to rent movies, and then download speeds changed, and their entire business was upended in an, in a nanosecond, and Netflix took took over, and now we can watch in, in as many movies as we want, as shows we want for ten dollars a month, and the entire infrastructure. So what did Blockbuster do? When, when seeing that technology change, they added candy aisles to their stores and they drove themselves off the cliff. So one year their profits went up because people wanted candy with their movie, movies and the next year it was gone. So, so now let's look at, uh, you would, myself would, uh, too, but records and, and, and cassette tapes. To, to understand music, we used to, to have to choose a very little amount of music because of the distribution cost of music. And there was somebody else that chose music for us. So massive number of people wanted to create music to find us, but we had to go and choose. Somebody chose for us out of those massive number of people what music we would see and that would be on the shelf. So we only saw a fraction of the mu- music and it cost a lot. We spent, a, I remember my, my my cassette <laughs> carriers and everything else, how much I had for the fraction. Uh, so I spent a lot of money. Now music's ten dollars a month. Unlimited music has created a whole bunch more stars that would have never been found in a different world. And there's no measure of that GDP gain. It's abundance for less, and it doesn't show up in your former measures because it's been digitized. So the G- the efficiency that that gains. On a, on a construct of GDP, when you're measuring things, is completely gone. This call we're doing right now. So, so, so if, you, if you know, because I'm front seat of this, if you understand what's coming to Zoom and other technologies, so it'll make this feel like a real experience, this is a Gen 1 experience. Next, it completely changes. And, and that means, okay, we're doing this in Canada. I'm hiring talent all over the world. Right now, because I'll get the best labor anywhere if we're working from home and can do this. And it has massive implications on where we're going. So most of the deflation is in front of us, not behind us. <clears throat> so if it took 185 trillion before COVID in the last 20 years to stop a natural force and concentrated wealth and, and, and division of society as a result, can you imagine what's going to come next? Well, and you've raised the issue of jobs. So why don't we address that then? Because everybody watching this, a lot of the people have jobs. And you just described a scenario where all those people who used to work at Blockbuster, putting the candy on the aisles, well, they're all unemployed now. And every other industry 
you know, I mean, if you have to physically make something, if you are making a car, okay, I guess there has to be a human being there involved in some point. But as everything becomes more and more digital, you're right. You're, you need fewer and fewer people. And on the one hand, you already addressed it. That's a good thing because technology frees up time. So if I can use a washing machine to wash my clothes instead of using the old board that I had to, to do them on, I can do more in less. But does that not ultimately mean then that there are a lot fewer jobs? So this is the, the and, and I'm, there, I'm going to uh, say some things here, but they're true, but they're hard to, to face for people because of the, 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 that fear. And the more and more that, that an inflationary monetary policy pushes up prices against the natural order of things, the more fear that's created for jobs because because you you have to you you you're at having prices up here and you wonder how you're going to pay for food um, if if you don't have a job and that fear keeps you in a system and keeps central banks in a system that makes the problem worse and worse so that's on on one side of it on the other side of it I, I, I'd say at the highest level here's a pretty simple why don't we why don't we pay people to create air for us oxygen because again, it's it's, it's, it's abundant already. It's, abundant. it's free. Yeah, it's ludicrous. So so should we have oxygen? Should we have the oxygen jobs? Um, and and so so why would you so so you if you allow the jobs to come out, prices in a free market fall as a corresponding. And, and essentially, what happens is you free your time. We're stop. So what is money in the first place? Money is an abstract concept. All it is is a trade of your time. So, so you have some money today um, that you were paid today and you expect that money to go to, to buy, buy something later. It's worthless. The money itself is, it's, it's measured against the things you want in your life, food, clothing, shelter, other th vacations and everything else. So the money itself is just a unit of account of your time. So if you manipulate the money itself, then you manipulate our time. And that's what you're saying. The, the bigger game is the repercussions around the world from manipulating people's time. It's such keep, keeping them. Sorry. Um, it's probably one of your creditors calling. I can't <laughs> it, right? exactly. Give me a call afterwards. We'll <laughs> um, but keeping, keeping people on a system where, where essentially they're trying to, they're on most wheels, racing faster and faster and faster to try to save enough money to escape the, the theft of inflation so that they can one day retire and hopefully enjoy their time. Seems like an awfully, I know it's the other systems completely different, but it seems like an awfully, if you just examine that, that seems like an awfully unjust system. Yeah. And I think people have got a sense of that over the last year because I don't have to spend two hours in my car going back and forth to work if I'm able to work from home. I just freed up a chunk of my time because of technology. Right. And yeah. So if you if you carry that on and, and it's now in, in, in government, I spoke to the House of Commons and everything else. And we're speaking to the House of Commons. They're trying to protect jobs in Canada and they're using Zoom. And there's not one job in Canada on Zoom. I know the founder of Zoom um, really, really well. So it, it, technology is borderless. And so how is the government going to stop something from moving into the cloud <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, and, and saving, uh, saving our time? Yeah, and this leads into the issue of inequality that you talked about earlier. So if I sell my time, and that's how I generate, you know, money to live. I've got a problem because technology is going to replace that. The people who have won up to this point are the people who have held assets. So if you bought a house, you know, five years ago, it doesn't matter where you bought it, doesn't matter how much you paid, worst section of town, doesn't matter. It's probably worth a lot more than what you paid for it. You look like a genius. Same if you put your money in an index fund or in Bitcoin or any other asset. Um, and that's obviously created a, a huge amount of, of inequality. So what do we do about this then? Because the, the rich continue to get richer. The poor or the person who works for a living continues to be disadvantaged as technology takes over their jobs. Um, are we not all pooched here? 
Yeah, so there's a, this, is a, this is a tough situation because the existing system cannot change it, but people believe it can. So when, when governments say, we're going to tax the rich and give it to the poor, and we're going to create inflation to do so, what they're really saying is we're going to pick your pocket faster and control the market. And I'm going to give you an example. So the U.S. deficit in one year last year was $4 trillion. This year, it'll be about the same. The structural deficit um, is about $2 trillion a year before COVID. So even if the economy came back roaring and everything else, you have a structural def deficit of $2 trillion a year. So every year, it adds that amount of debt. A very minimum to these years, four trillion, and probably a bunch more. That's without the unfunded liabilities of pensions and, and everything else in the U.S. Canada's worse shape, in worse shape. So, if, you, if for for your listeners, but that's what the U.S. looks like. If you taxed a hundred percent of all the profits of all the companies in the U.S., it equals two point two five trillion per year. There's no way out. So, what, so the way out it, when you get this bad and so what would happen to your clients individually when you get this, there's a reset coming. But if you're a government, you don't have to reset in that way. You hide it in inflation. You make the, you, you denominate the dollars differently and you, and, and you reset in a different way. But that inflation is a massive hidden wealth transfer to the rich. And, and, and the political game is, oh, we're going to charge the rich more. But they, but 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 what's really happening underneath is you're enriching them more. We've talked. I did a show on on modern <clears throat> modern monetary theory, which yeah. you know you are familiar with. Basically, it says, well, I just print money. Like the government can print money. It's all fake anyway. So print as much as you want. The only thing you have to worry about is inflation. So print as much as you want. The technology that we've got is driving deflation. So governments can print, 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 and everything will be fine. And if you look at last year in Canada, I mean, the, the federal deficit was, I don't know, $400 billion or whatever it was. We were able to give CERB to 9 million people. So what's the problem? We can print as much money as we want. Clearly, it hasn't caused inflation yet because we've got the technology forcing it the other way. Why not just solve the problem that way? Universal basic income, money for everybody. It's all good. So if you just follow the next step of what I just said, um, then if you did that, then, then essentially you're concentrating, concentrating wealth and power. As a byproduct, you're having a ma completely managed economy. Managed economies don't perform well over time. And, and as a result of those things, you're concentrating all power in government. Once you do that, rights and freedoms go away. And look around, look at look through history for any example of what happens when when essentially you have an absolute ruler, absolutely, and that person has control of the printing press. Um, and there is no free market. That what, what ends up happening, it, it's, it's not a very, it's what happened, it's what happened to bring in um, uh, Hitler in Germany. And, and who, did, who did Hitler turn on? He turned on the people with the wealth, right? Because you can fool a lot of people that are left out of that equation as you've concentrated all, all of, all of that, that wealth. And you can say, it, you can, you can, you, so people will vote for the short term. In fact, that's what they're doing right now in Canada. So that's what, what Trudeau is, is doing is that he's actually, and, and I hate to say this, but, but by the way, it's not, it's, there is no actor in the system, whether it's Trudeau or on the conservative side, there's no actor in the system that can change the system from within because it's just math. So, but what he's doing, so I'm not saying this as a, as a political uh, thing or anything else, but what he's doing or a different actor would do is create money faster to be able to give away because the consequence of not doing that allows deflation to happen and everything resets. And then the next person comes in and says, I'll print more. So that's the system we live in, unfortunately. But what, as a result, what, he, what you're doing is he's picking the pocket of the people that, that believe him the most and transferring it to to to, uh, to the wealthy. That's uh, and and concentrating more and more power into government. Now you so you said he's transferring it to the wealthy. That seems 
the opposite of what happened. I mean, the Serb checks did not go to the wealthy. They went to the people who were not wealthy. So didn't this all work out great? So that's the short term. That's what it looks like. But the Serb che checks go into increasing food, increasing uh, rents, increasing because, because the assets are going up faster. So that's what it, it just creates the wealth transfer faster. But in the short term, people are saying, now I can eat. Um, but then they don't realize what's happening over. Uh, I, I can, now I can pay my rent that just went. My rent just went up uh, by by twenty five percent or ten percent this year. Now I can pay my rent. I don't have to worry. But but that rent going up in a transfer for the people who have the assets is a staggering win. So that's what's that's what's happening. So the short term implications people don't know what they're making that long term long term bet, and it doesn't matter what actor you have in the system. Um, it's, it's a system problem, not an actor problem. Yeah. And so you're saying we have recency <clears throat> bias just because the temperature was 20 degrees yesterday doesn't mean it will be 20 degrees forever. Things will, things will ultimately change. So, okay. So let's finish off with debt. This show is called Debt Free in 30. We talk to people <laughs> yeah. about their debt. So we got we to gotta talk about that. Obviously, governments are, I mean, you already throw, threw out the numbers there, creating massive, massive amounts of debt. And, you know, there's the debate about whether that's a problem or not. To me, it seems obvious that it's a problem because you got to pay it back. But the MMTers would say, no, no, so long as the economy grows, it's, it's not a big deal. I don't want to talk about the government because you and I can't change that. Let's talk about an individual person. So there's a human being watching us today and they are carrying debt. Let's say they owe money on their credit cards. Okay. In an inflationary environment, debt is actually good. Because yeah. my, my dollars are becoming worth less and the, the debt remains fixed. So I'm paying back the debt in less valuable dollars. That's great. So, so long as we have inflation, the more debt, the better. You don't think that's a great long-term strategy for an individual, I take it. So what is your advice to an individual human being who perhaps is, is carrying debt or isn't? I mean, what, what's your general advice, not to governments, but to individual people? I've, uh, I, I've gone through every calculus possible on how to get out of this mess. And what I realized, the Blockbuster example is a really good example and what a typical business does when a structural change bring, is by technology uh, is forced upon them. What they'd normally do is they retrench and try to make their existing business work. What's actually happening at government policy level and every individual policy level as a byproduct is that's what's happened and that's what's happening. So you could say that, that the government is adding candy aisles to their stores. That's uh, now what should you do? And I, and, and I, and, and normally again, same thing going into business, what ends up happening is the, the, a technology change imposes a new order on government over time. And, the, and that new order changes everything because it, it, it empowers so many people. I believe with a high probability that that new order is actually Bitcoin and that, uh, that every individual should be, it should be by a hundred dollars, but buy it every week. Um, and, and then, but don't, don't do it because I said, so investigate Bitcoin down to the sand and understand what it isn't, what you, what a lot of people, what the, what the fear and everything else thinks it is, what, it, what it is, is I think it's going to read, remake our monetary system into something that allows a uh, deflation to benefit humanity. So it's going to, if you measured your world in Bitcoin. You just said so again, th and this is where it's hard because it, you, we met, we go from one system and then we think biz, Bitcoin is just a pricing engine, right? Oh, it's going to go up in price. That's true, but what's really happening is everything else is going down in price against it. So, and your monetary unit shouldn't be uh, be changing. It's just it's measuring properly what's happening around the rest of the world, but we measure a system from the system we're in and that system we're in is actually being manipulated. So it's hard to understand the measure measurement on the other side, Bitcoin, because, because Bitcoin can't be manipulated because there's 21 million units fixed forever. And it's, um, it's, uh, and by, by code and, and math, which what you, you have a de decentralized, uh, 
system that is actually me measuring accurate prices. That's what, that's what, so I, th I think it's, it's a must, um, even as a lifeboat, I think it's a, um, from, from the coming economic storm and from the, or, or potentially social storm, I think it's a critical empowerment of humanity. So you're saying because things are eroding, I need to anchor it with something that isn't eroding. Exactly. So you're not saying, well, you got to buy Bitcoin because it's going to go up in price. You're saying it's essentially fixed. Everything else is, is going down, um, going down in, in value. Now, a lot of people are going to listen to that and go, well, you're nuts. Yep. Like, but a lot of people would, when I wrote my book, a lot of people would say, would, uh, would have said the same thing. I had to write it because everything I wrote is true, still true, first principles and, and everything else. I haven't heard one person the book's been out for a year and a half. I've had, to, uh, you can imagine, it's become a bestseller in multiple countries. I've had not one person debate the, the merits of that book and say that, 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 that everything that I said is true. There's not, there, there's, it's all true. I've had a lot of people say, well, we can't let that happen no matter what, so we'll keep manipulating money. I don't like the consequences of that being true. But not one, like, so, so when you realize that is true. I really don't care if people think I'm crazy. <laughs> the, that's a good attitude to have. Um, and, you know, if we talk again in 10 years, it'll be pretty clear whether you're crazy or not, I guess, because oh, it'll be... Oh, totally. It'll be so, uh, uh, people thought it was crazy that Elon Musk could uh, land a rocket after it was taken off, right? That, what, what, what drives human innovation, in fact, what drives, what, what drives a human race forward is people is people uh, making these bets and saying why does this look like this? It could look better. And by the way, the, a free economy is exactly the same thing. A free economy is a whole bunch of entrepreneurs questioning a system. And and I now today with technology is saying I can do it better for less. I can give you more for less. And we wouldn't use those innovations unless they worked. So if you just only just say what I just said it must be deflationary because we wouldn't use it otherwise. So if you were advising someone who owes X number of dollars on their credit card and the interest rate is really high, would you be advising them to, you know, I got an extra hundred bucks this week. Should I put it in Bitcoin or should I pay down my credit card? How do you make that decision? Um, to, to in today's world, um, I think Bitcoin will go up a lot faster than, than a 19% rate on a credit card. Now, would I go and leverage my, my uh, cash against, uh, would I leverage at 19% to buy Bitcoin? No, probably not. Um, but uh, but um, if I was already there and trapped in, in that, I might be buying Bitcoin. What is your advice on the job front then? Because it sounds like whatever job I have today might not be here tomorrow. So, so go and look for for your uh, listeners. Go and look at Boston Robotics, uh, those the, the 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 humanoid robots and 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 dogs and everything else. Go and look at them uh, ten years ago. So, and, and just to re reference how fast technology is coming, and then look at them today, and now think about what happens with artificial intelligence in those. And realize it's not just one job or one job of families. It's coming to everything. Now, that I say that and that will drive this fear response and it can't be true, even though it is true. Uh, I'm, on the opposite side, I'm, I'm, the amount of industries that are going through the structural change right now and how, how much opportunity there is right now, it's staggering. Like, I can't believe I get to do what I get to do with all of these companies and create, create value. So there's lots of opportunity. So I don't want to scare people because a lot, what, what, what you're seeing is the long-term trend will be less jobs. And that should be a good thing if we allow the, uh, the economy to work that way. It means product, productivity should reduce prices. That's how it should, should work. Um, so, so that should be a good thing, but inside that long-term trend, there's tons of opportunity. There's tons of opportunity, especially if you know how the game board's play, being played and what jobs are going to be, what jobs are more important or what industries are more important in the new world 
than, than we're in the old world, especially if you understand this framework, you actually have a superpower in understanding this framework and how fast it's is moving because you can be on the right side of history and the right side of the, this change. So what is an example of a, either a job or an industry that I should be gravitating towards? And what's an example of one that, you know what, that one's dying fast. Don't go into that. Uh, well, they, what I'd say is they come, uh, it, 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 they come faster than you think, right? And because technology is moving exponentially, I don't, I'm not trying to sell books here, but read my book because it's important in, um, in, um, in that. Um, the, um, but, but an, an example of something that we'll see lots of, lots of movement in the next little while, and there's a whole build out coming around it is solar and batteries. And solar is dropping in price 11% per year. And it's already the lowest energy. It's already the lowest energy cost in most in a bunch of regions. So you imagine that's more deflation coming, and energy is the number one input in everything else we do. So everything else has to come down as a byproduct. By the way, uh, just as an aside, when governments say we're going to stop uh, stop uh, climate change by printing money to grow forever, and and energy is reducing in price. What they're really saying is we need to increase energy costs <laughs> faster to drive climate change. So there's no way actually that this, so it's against the free market. But anyway, solar would be one that would be, uh, be growing um, as an example. Lots of industries as they're being digitized. Like uh, when you think about what you can do with data to reduce, pr uh, to re uh, reduce price and, and reimagine giving more value, there's tons of industries still going through that uh, that change. Some of the some of the um, some of the industries that will experience pain, there still be jobs there, and there'll be jobs there because of this. Um, when you drive inflation, it's wage deflation. So so a lot of those lower paying jobs, essentially, what ends up happening is the business can still support the below paying jobs because the labor component of the job just went down, but people don't know it. So the chase to jobs through a, an artificial mandate of paying people less seems, it seems, seems crazy. But if those jobs get too expensive, what those businesses are going to do is remove that labor through technology. Yeah, so you've got to always be looking a few <clears throat> steps ahead, understanding what's going on, which is exactly why I wanted to have you on this podcast so that you can be you can be thinking ahead. I mean, and you're right. This affects every area, every industry, everything. It it it, it it's central to. It's not an economics um, book. It is an economics book and everything else, but it's a life book because we don't realize how much of our decisions are actually rooted in economics, um, or or an ability to get uh, ability to to feed our families, to be able to get more, be able to have more, to be able to travel. It's all rooted in economics. So when you, when you manipulate <laughs> currencies, you manipulate our lives. And that's what's, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, that's, that's what's happening and it has pretty vast consequences. So final question then, any other final words of advice, thoughts, anything, um, you know, give me something somewhat a little hopeful. I mean, we're, we're all, the, the system's going to crash and we're all done. Let's not end with that. What, what is the, either the hopeful message or the practical message you can leave the individual with today? So that's actually why I'd, I'd say investigate Bitcoin, not from the fear and dismissal of it, investigate it, really research it as one. There is so much opportunity today. I'm, I, I, again, I am blown away with how much opportunity there is. I get asked about 300 boards a year. <laughs> and so I see a whole bunch of different businesses, really great entrepreneurs making a difference in the, in, in the world and, cha and changing things. Tons of really exciting businesses and tons of value coming to society. Individually, why I say Bitcoin is change your view on driving um, something to a technology that cannot be manipulated and you'll start to see what, what we're talking about and you'll be on, and, and you'll, you'll just see opportunity. You, you might see opportunities everywhere. Excellent. Opportunities everywhere. That's the way I like to like to end <laughs> it. 
Excellent. Thank you very much, Jeff. So the book is The Price of Tomorrow, Why Deflation is the Key to an Abundant Future. We covered about the first two pages of the book, in case people are, <laughs> people are wondering. Um, I've, I've read the book. I've read it three times, actually. I've, I've made, made lots of notes on it. There's a whole bunch of things here to make you think. And, and I think that's my message to everyone watching today. And that is, okay, don't be believing anything I say. Don't be believing anything you say. Um, and if it sounds crazy and everything you talked about today sounds crazy, you know, yeah, it, 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 it sounds like, like the exact <clears throat> opposite of reality and telling people to, uh, you know, deflation is coming, Bitcoin, I mean, it, it all sounds totally crazy. But I think if you do think it through, um, it, it certainly gives everyone some some food for thought. How can people find you? Uh, you know, where's the best place to troll you? Is it on Twitter or, or where? <laughs> Probably the best place is on Twitter. Just at Jeff Booth on Twitter. Excellent. Your your name. I like your name because it's two words, Jeff Booth. They're both one syllable. The first name is four letters and the second name is five letters, just like Doug Hoy. So you're the first person <laughs> on the show who's ever been in that in that situation. So uh, Jeff, thank you very much for being here today. I much appreciate it. Thanks, Doug. This was fun. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. That is our show for today. Uh, full show notes and links to what we talked about will be on YouTube. And again, you can find Jeff Booth on Twitter at Jeff, J-E-F-F Booth, B-O-O-T-H. That's our show for today. Until next week, I'm Doug Hoyes. Thanks for listening. That was Debt Free in 30 or 45. There we go.